uh, thank you all for having me here to uh, Winter Weekend. I have told a few of you I never turned down an opportunity to come up to the river, be it summer or winter. So I'm going to be talking about invasive species, some updates, and uh, some actions that you can be taking to prevent invasive species. And um, I organized the talk um, somewhat structured. Um, I'm going to be talking about the big three, the big three ways that invasive species get into the Great Lakes St. Lawrence River region, uh, commercial shipping, um, artificial connections and waterways, and uh, through importation and trade. And for each one of those um, three um, ways that species get in, I'm going to be talking about the past um, briefly, what's happened, um, why it happened, how, how those species um, came in and what kind of impact. Um, I'm going to be talking about the current status of um, our protections or lack of protections um, from stopping those invading, invasions, future invasions. And then I'm going to talk about the future, which is what's coming up, what opportunities to stop the next big invader um, is going to be coming up in the next year or so, and how you can get involved. And um, I'm really um, excited to be talking about Save River because you guys already are doing it. You guys have been um, historic leaders with um, a lot of invasive species protections and certainly are already very well engaged. So, um, so let's talk about the first um, of the big three, commercial shipping and ballast. As you guys are probably very well know, um, ballast really wasn't a huge um, vector for invasive species until the St. Lawrence Seaway was constructed and opened in 59. Since 59, 68% of the new established invasive species came from overseas shipping, either stuck to the holes or in the ballast tanks. So the types of species we, we, we saw because of ballast include <coughs> the zebra mussel um, came in in the late 1980s, the phytrites, the spiny water fleas, um, and the round goby, which I actually, um, I think it's been a lot more round gobies in the river last summer than I ever remember. Um, that's actually not a picture of a salty, um, but uh, it, it, it just to show you, to demonstrate the commercial, um, the commercial shipping vector. So they have had a serious impact on the Great Lakes. Um, the, the current state of research by economic um, the current state of the economic analysis is that up to at least $200 million in annual costs because of these ballast mediated invaders just to the Great Lakes states alone. So we're talking about um, hits to the commercial and sport fishing industry, um, the, the increased cost to water infrastructure, um, power plants, municipalities have taken water um, that get clogged with the zebra mussels and um, also lost revenue because of wildlife blasting. So this is a big um, economic um, drain on our region. So what, has, what is our current state of regulations? Our current state of regulations is um, after the zebra mussel invasion, both countries started to regulate ballast. And it took about 10 years before ballast water exchanged the flushing of, of um, ballast water from overseas vessels became a legal requirement that happened in 1996. And um, just another 10 years after that, both Canada and the U.S. Seaway required no bob flushing. The vessels that don't have ballast water, but they have residual foreign material in their tanks to flush out those tanks. So it's taken over 20 years, about 20 years since the zebra mussel invasion for every single overseas vessel that comes to the Great Lakes to have to physically flush out their tanks. Um, it certainly is a big help, and we're very glad that they're doing that, but it did take a long time. Um, we do have um, a very complicated uh, regulatory requirement for vessels coming into the Great Lakes. We have the Coast Guard, who's in charge of things on the U.S. side, Transport Canada on the Canadian side, the two seaways, which have authority, um, the EPA in the U.S. just was recently granted authority, and the states are now all players as well. So there's a lot of a lot of um, hands in the pot trying to regulate international shipping coming into the Great Lakes. Um, and uh, what we've seen is that um, you are in this in-between place where the states and the Coast Guard um, have rules that are either on the books or emerging um, in just a few months 
but those those rules are not yet implemented on vessels. So we're we're still we're still um, reliant on the physical management practices that the ships have to comply with. And in the next few years, we're going to be seeing technology being placed on vessels to meet either state or Coast Guard regulations. Um, for example, New York State has a rule that um, technology will have to be installed on vessels by as soon as uh, 2012. So uh, we're kind of in that in-between in place. So what's happening in the future? Um, well, some of the big questions are um, how will this, all these jurisdictions interact? One of the main concerns with the shipping industry is inconsistent regulation. So there's a big effort on the federal level to try to harmonize some of the regulations. How will the technologies that are going to be placed on vessels work in fresh water? A lot of these technologies are being developed for saltwater use, and are they going to be as effective as in fresh water? How are we going to monitor for compliance? There's a lot of really big questions regarding how are these tech new regulations going to be implemented. And there's some opportunities coming up in the next year um, or two that uh, Save the River and different individuals can, can get involved in. Um, there's going to be opportunities for public en engagement. Um, the Canada Shipping Act is going to be um, updated. It, they're going to be setting uh, regulations for overseas saltwater vessels. Um, probably by the end of this year, and then domestic um, Canadian vessels following that. The EPA's Vessel General Permit is going to be updated. They're going to be um, up, uh, updating that by um, 2013. And we also are working to support New York State state requirements, because until the federal government takes strong action, the states are at the forefront of this. And I do want to thank Save the River for initiating a lot of that work. Um, State River has contacted my organization, Great Lakes United, and, and others, and let's support New York State. And we've sent letters to the new, um, the new governor and the new uh, attorney general, making sure that they know how important it is for New York to be a leader in ballast water protection. So the next of the big three is um, inner uh, artificial waterways or um, artificial connections between the Great Lakes and other um, other subcontinental watersheds. As you guys have probably seen a lot of, um, the Asian carp are knocking at the door of Lake Michigan and the Chicago area. Um, the jumping carp is the silver carp. And we also have the big head carp. If you see the big giant ones being held up in photographs, those are usually the big heads. And the ones that are flying out of the water are the silvers. And the reason why this is such an issue is um, the Asian carp invaded the Mississippi River Basin and has swum up the Mississippi in the past 20 years, moved across the entire continent like wildfire. And they're now ready to invade Lake Michigan because of an artificial canal system that connected the waters of the Mississippi with Lake Michigan. So um, we, uh, this has all happened um, over, over the past 10 years. There's been slow progress to try to put in place some deterrence in the Chicago area waterway to uh, keep invasive species from moving in both directions. This isn't just an Asian carp issue threatening the Great Lakes. There are invasive species that have gotten into the Great Lakes that are moving down the Chicago area waterway system and invading the Mississippi Basin. The Round Gobi, for example, has invaded the Mississippi from, uh, from the Great Lakes. So there is an electric barrier, the dispersal barriers that were put in place to deter um, fish that swim. And um, those, that activity has been happening over the past 10 or more years. Uh, but just at the beginning of last year, um, the end of 2009, a new novel um, detection technique uh, emerged. Um, researchers from the University of Notre Dame started taking water samples and looking for Asian carp DNA. And they started finding Asian carp DNA much, much closer to Lake Michigan than anyone thought. And so um, it became an emergency situation at the beginning of last year. And NGOs, the states, um, the federal government, everyone really responded quickly. And in the history of working on this invasive species in the Great Lakes, I was stunned with how quickly people started moving on this issue, especially the federal government. So um, 
I know it's, it's like nothing's ever fast enough, but it was, it was pretty impressive, to tell you the truth. So here's what's happening right now and the things that happened last year and are still currently happening. There's a two-pronged approach when dealing with trying to prevent Asian carp. The first is these short-term emergency actions, which um, the federal government and the states really stepped up to, to the plate and worked on very um, intensely last year. They worked to um, improve and um, complete the dispersal barrier system and make sure that there was duality and redundancy in that system. So in case one barrier went down, there was already another um, operating. They worked to stop floodwaters. There's infested um, waterways around Chicago Canal that could flood into the canal and carry um, live Asian carp into the canal. And so they worked to stop the floodwaters and um, create some barriers around there. They also did some of the world's largest rope known treatments and had some temporary kill zones to, uh, to uh, when they shut down the barriers for maintenance. Um, those were actually, those are potentially controversial. It's not something that we can keep on doing as a long-term maintenance solution. Um, they did modify lock, lock operations during uh, many of those kill oper um, operations. And um, they spent um, upwards of seven to eight million dollars last year on these emergency actions. Um, this year's budget is closer to 34 million. And in case you're curious as far as why is the reduction, a lot of those um, investments last year were one-time investments that we just don't need to repeat. The barriers, um, investments in the barriers, investments in, in um, stopping floodwaters and plugging up some of the culverts, you don't have to do those every single year. So there was a lot of um, expenditures front-ended into last year. One of the most um, important parts though is, um, you know, these emergency actions are absolutely critical. We have to make sure the carp don't get in in the short term, but we need to move as quickly as possible to the long-term solutions, these hydrological um, separation solutions. Um, the basic um, theory here is that if water doesn't flow between the Mississippi and the Great Lakes, fish won't swim. It's as simple as that. So there's a very strong um, push to try to restore the subcontinental watershed divide um, that was breached um, over a century ago. And there's two big things happening right now. The Army Corps of Engineers was authorized in Word of 2007 to study this issue. It's called the, uh, they were authorized to study the, um, the Great Lakes, um, Glimmeris, the Great Lakes Mississippi River Basin the Inner Basin Feasibility Study. They dropped a few letters so you can actually say it as an acronym, I guess. Um, they have been moving very slowly, in our opinion. Um, they were authorized in 2007. They just started doing um, public hearings. We're in the middle of a public hearing session right now. Um, and uh, there are opportunities for public comments to be um, submitted to the Army Corps of Engineers, which are due um, this, this year, March. 31st. Um, we, uh, you have received, um, if you are on to the risk analyst, you've already received action alerts for this and there's going to be opportunities for the organizations to submit comments um, across the region. NGOs are going to be submitting comments, so I know that we're going to be working closely together still on that. The big issues, the concerns with the Glimmer study is how slow it is. Um, the Army Corps is projecting that they won't have recommendations out until 2015. Um, and we're kind of saying that's a really long time, we're kind of in panic mode right now. Could you do it in 18 months? Can you front load some of the recommendations for the biggest threat area, the Chicago area of waterway, in 18 months? Um, so that's one of the main recommendations. Um, another recommendation is they're not just looking at Chicago, they're looking at all, all potential um, conduits uh, for Asian carp to move into the Great Lakes from the Mississippi re region. There's other breaches in the watershed, other canals and smaller um, artificial connections. And um, as troubling as those additional connections are, the carp are pressing against the Chicago area. So we're asking them to front load recommendations for Chicago. Let's take care of the biggest threat first. And um, the, one of the, the third most, the third complaint we have is that um, 
in a word out, Congress told the Army Corps of Engineers to prevent in, um, the movement of species, and they have modified their study to also reduce the risk. And so we are quite adamant that this study needs to come out with recommendations that will stop the Asian carp. Because reduction of risk sooner or later, um, you know, if, if you fail and the fish get here, um, we've lost. So we want to make sure that they focus very, very intently on prevention, not just risk reduction. So in your packets, there is an action alert. If you'd like to write letters, um, we'd, we'd love to see um, additional input into the Army Corps of Engineers to make sure that this study does what it needs to do and stop the issue part. Um, the great thing is um, our um, leadership in the region with the Great Lakes Commission and the Great Lakes St. Lawrence City Initiative said we want to do more than just write letters and let you know what we should be studying. We want to be part of this study. And the Great Lakes Commission and the city's initiative took a, a very big step forward and they invested um, $2 million, they raised $2 million to study hydrologic separation. Where would we recreate the, the natural watershed divide in the Chicago area? How would we do it? Um, and they are studying hydrologic separation with the intent of being able to pass that data along to the Army Corps of Engineers so they can incorporate it into their study and so that um, we can accelerate the timeline and get some of this work done faster than um, the federal government is doing. So um, we're extremely pleased that the Great Lakes Commission has taken that leadership role on and um, we're encouraging the Corps to, uh, to move as quickly as possible um, on their learning study. So please take a, take a moment to look at that actionware in your packets. So what about the future? There's a, a few additional um, things that we're looking to in the next year um, to move um, this, uh, this initiative forward. Um, Congress was troubled that the Corps was uh, redefining the study to be a prevention study, and there was a bill introduced last year, the Permanent Prevention of Aging Carp Act, and um, it will be most likely reintroduced again this um, congressional session. Um, and what it does, it just straightforward clarifies that this is a prevention study and um, you know, that the Corps should uh, get information out quicker than five years. Um, the New York Senators were on it last year, already signed on to it. The region is very sensitized to it. I know Save the River has been you know, making sure that people know, um, the Senators know about this. So um, we anticipate that New York will be strong on, on this bill again. Um, there will be a House version, so that's something that could be worked on, getting um, our federal uh, representatives on a House version of the Permanent Prevention of Asian Carp Act. Um, another opportunity is that um, if there are any emergencies in the upcoming year, we need to make sure the Army Corps of Engineers has the authority to take action. Um, it's, it's important that they know that they can, they can uh, modify operations of the locks or take part in a, an, a, a road known treatment or um, block off a culvert without having to go back to Congress for authorization to do so. We were given an um, emergency authorization last year, but it was just for one year, and so we do need to make sure that they're given that authorization again this year. And um, as folks talked about earlier, we are very concerned that Great Lakes Regional Initiative funding is going to be significantly cut this year, and um, a lot of the Asian carp prevention emergency <coughs> funding has been coming from the GLRI, so we are trying to keep um, an eye out to make sure that carp funding is not slashed. Um, and again, um, thanks, to, thanks to you guys and Save the River for being on top of that and making sure that your elected officials know that GLRI funding and aging car prevention funding is absolutely critical to the region. So the third of the big three is, is screening, and it's actually something that's not on a lot of people's radars yet. Um, screening or um, the importation of live um, animals for trade has been occurring for over a century and these are animals that have been brought into the country for a variety of purposes. 
Um, you've got your salmon, which have been stocked into the region. You've got um, large um, exotic snakes that have been brought in by the pig pet industry. The Burmese python is invading the Everglades, if you've heard about that. The lionfish and aquarium importation, which has invaded coastal waters of the Atlantic Ocean. The snake had, again, another exotic um, aquarium fish that was brought in. Um, the snake has inv invaded the Potomac area, the Maryland area. And of course, our trouble species right now, the Asian carp, were also imported as live animals um, down south to clean up infested waterways. So what we have is um, a situation where, um, oh, yeah, and in addition to the live animals being brought in, um, these animals often carry diseases, and we're not looking to see what kind of disease is on these animals. So um, the one that kind of creeps me out the most is this mon monkey pox virus. This, um, in the live pet trade, this giant Gambian rat was brought in and it carried a virus that impacts um, you know, our, our native prairie dogs, but it also infests humans. So we do, don't have an adequate mechanism for screening animals that are being imported into the country for either invasiveness or for carrying diseases that could hurt our native wildlife or ourselves. So our current state of regulations is, um, or our current state of the situation is that we have a very, very robust live trade um, occurring into um, the United States. The Defenders of Wildlife Organization um, did an analysis and they looked, the FOIA information from 2000 to 2004, and what they saw was that over 2,000 um, non-native aquatic or terrestrial animal species were imported <coughs> over that time period. Those were, only, those were the ones that were actually identified on the species level. They said that there were animals that were identified just as frogs. And you can't really tell what kind of frog that is. They, they, these are over 2,241 identified species. So that's not all, either numbers, total numbers, or volume, or tons, or pounds. These are di different individual species that were imported. Of those, they did a literature research. How many of those just from what we know about on the internet and online and through our universities and make, meet the basic criteria for regulation. Have they invaded another area or can they carry disease? And of those 2,241, they said, based on the literature research, research, research at least 302 met those basic criteria. But of all those 302 different species, only 34 have had some sort of restriction put in place. So we've got a very active trade of live organisms that present a real risk to, um, to our country's natural resources and human health and economy. So what's happening right now to try to get our arms around this? Um, there is a Senate bill that's being worked on um, to hopefully improve the Fish and Wildlife Authority under the Lacey Act to basically put the, the, the cart, the horse in front of the cart. Right now, the Fish and Wildlife Service under the Lacey Act, which is a legislation that's over 100 years old, can regulate something after it's already here. Um, and it's a very slow um, listing process. For example, the Asian carp species finally just got better, um, better listed under the Lacey Act and controlled, uh, better regulated under the Lacey Act by being listed as injurious. So um, you cannot possess a live, a live Asian carp and move it from one state to another. But what we need to do is give the Fish and Wildlife Service the power to look at what's being proposed for importation and say, you can't bring that new species into the United States because if it got loose, it would cause a tremendous amount of damage. So we're looking to empower the Fish and Wildlife Service to give them a more protective, preventative, pre-import screening authority. And we, we would like to see them screen live animals for invasiveness or disease. And then if, uh, if they do meet those criteria, they can't come in in the first place and we can't see the investment in those species in trade. We also are waiting, uh, we are, we're pushing the Department of the Interior to release a report that um, could recommend ways to improve um, 
regulations under current authority. So we're looking to give the Fish and Wildlife Service new authority, and we're looking for ways to speed up the listing process um, with the authority the Fish and Wildlife Service has right now. And so those are those are the big three um, ways species can get into the country and different um, the status of where we are and where we can go in the future. Again, I want to say thank you to everyone in in the audience and in, in Save the River who has been already working so hard on ballast water and Asian carp prevention. And um, hopefully the last one didn't scare you too much. It is um, another big vector that we need to start addressing real soon. And we've just started looking at it. So I hope, I hope you found that informative. And we'll be working on it together very soon.